things are finally starting to look up. I don't know how, but I'm sure this is my fault. I was shooting the Goldbergs at the time and was about to do a big funny scene. I pick up the phone and go, Stephen, we have a little bad news. And it like, heart goes to the floor. Looks like our little show has come to an end here at Netflix. And then I hear a knock on the door of my trailer. Stephen, we're ready to shoot the scene. I'm like, what, what? And, and I'm about to break down in tears and I have to do this funny scene. Equally as shocking as that was, was our resurrection. I got the news that Pop TV had picked up one day at a time for a relaunch, and I was ecstatic. My, my expectations were 180 degrees wrong the entire time. Everywhere I've gone, no matter where in the world, at Heathrow Airport, a French uh, waitress came running out, Dr. Berkowitz, Dr. Berkowitz. I will lose my job if they know I'm talking to you, but I have to tell you one day at a time is the story of my family. I get emails from all over the Brazil, from the far, all, all over, and people go, I love this show because it is about my family. I'm going, how is that possible? It's a Cuban family in Los Angeles. How is it possible that this is a show of all these people's family? And then it struck me that I think what One Day at a Time does is has created this unique mirror that people see their own lives in this family, all scrambling, trying to find little successes in life. Nor Norman Lear, you know? And oh, gosh, I yes. think he installs that in all of his shows. You did the uh, Live in Front of a Studio Audience uh, special for him. <laughs> <laughs> live in Front of yeah. a Studio Audience is a blood sport. That, <laughs> that was crazy. <laughs> It was terrifying because we had very little <laughs> rehearsal, and uh, you're you're going live only in front of like 20 million people, and and so no big deal there. Uh, one of the executives, a uh, dear fellow I love very much from Sony, said, "Well, you know, we looked at various actors for your role, but we needed an actor that was big enough for Jamie to jump on their back." So. Basically, I got that part because I was big enough for Jamie Foxx to jump up and down on me. So, hey, I'll take it. All could we, all could we, all could, it's live. <laughs> Everyone sitting at home just think their TV just messed up. No rehearsal. We, we, I, I think we started the Jeffersons on Thursday with a read-through. Friday, we did a run-through for Norman Lear. Monday, we had our first audience in which I forgot my name. I had no idea what my name was on the show. I have to introduce myself. I'm, I'm, and, and so in front of the audience, and, and Jim Burroughs came up to me and goes, uh, so um, he's very soft spoken. So it seems you were a little maybe um, nervous last night? And I go, yeah. Then Tuesday night, they bring clocks backstage because everything has to go exactly according to the clock. And they tape that as if it's real, and then Wednesday you do the live show. And so, <laughs> oh, I was never so happy when we were done. And, and there was a great feeling of success and relief. That was terrifying. I loved it. And, yeah. and thank goodness for Norman and Jimmy Kimmel and, and everybody for bringing that to the world. You had mentioned getting the part because of your size, your height. Has, has that happened uh, previously in your career? <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious if that was a recurring theme. Oh for you. gosh, uh, <laughs> let's see. I, I I had one experience in my career where I came in and the casting director looked at me and goes, "You were fatter before, weren't you?" <laughs> and and I go, "Well, I'm I'm not really. Sure. Would you be offended if we put you in a fat suit?" And I'm going like. No, <laughs> not if you give me the job. There is the tall crowd, the tall cast, and the short cast. Hmm. So like if you have Dustin Hoffman or, you know, Richard Dreyfuss or you, 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 you those, I'm probably not going to be cast with those people. But if you have like Chevy Chase and, and Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd, you know, then I'm going to be in the large <laughs> cast. So I am one of the people in the large cast. And uh, 
I'm happy to be there. So sometimes you get a script and you're like, well, who else is in it? You're like, well, I don't even have a chance to <laughs> there don't at all. Have a Tom Cruise? No, Tom Cruise. forget it. People who make movies don't care about sports. Not true. Alfred Hitchcock's star tailback, Ron Howard decathlete, Ridley Scott hockey goon. The executives at Sony know what my schedule is on one day at a time and know when I'm going to have time off and saying, you know, Stephen, we're going to need you next week on, the, on my week off of one day at a time. They'll slip me in in the Goldbergs. And another thing, if you notice on the Goldbergs, I have a lot of scenes in my principal's office. And that you could shoot any day, any time. I am the principal of this school. And I am the principal of this gym. The gym is inside the school, so I am principal of both. Damn it, that tracks. I noticed how many principals I've been lately. I mean, I'm a principal on the Loud House, and there I'm just a voiceover. <laughs> I think I went straight from teacher to principal. Well, I, I assume there has to be some great stories about young principals in love. Maybe that could have Maybe been that would have <laughs> for you. Freaky Friday, Yes, I was a teacher who was in love with Jamie Lee when we were younger, and she blighted me, blighted romance. I guess I've never really had a real love affair on a show except for now one day at a time mm -hmm. with Rita and myself. This is the closest I've ever gotten to a real kiss. You have often found yourselves group playing a pedophile as well. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. I, 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 but I haven't played pedophiles recently. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but but it used to be the go-to <laughs> was, <laughs> was either a principal or a pedophile, uh, or <laughs> or uh, a doctor of some mm -hmm. sort. Like mm -hmm. I've been a medical man quite often, mm -hmm. and I've been politician quite often. So the pedophile role could go easily with <laughs> any of those as well. But recently, I've, I've been out of the pedophile business, yeah. which is which is good. I'm so glad. I had open heart surgery, which was scary, very scary. But one thing that I didn't realize was one of the scariest things, it didn't even dawn on me, was the idea, am I ever going to work again? That didn't cross my mind because I was afraid I was going to die on the table or something like that. But community and glee came up and each gave me a show right after my surgery. Community, four weeks after, I was still stapled together and community gave me a show. And then Glee, three weeks later, gave me a show where I had to do a song and dance in the detention hall. I'm there with my wife, with my blood pressure cup, with everything. And I was saying, please, guys, whatever you do, don't make me dance. <laughs> and <laughs> I could die. Yeah. And uh, not only that, I can't really dance. So, <laughs> uh, But in my heart of hearts, and, and I think not this Emmy Award season, but last Emmy Award season, uh, they seated me next to Ryan uh, uh, Murphy. And, and I was able to tell him, thank you so much for letting me not only be on Glee, that wonderful, wonderful show, and knowing those wonderful people, but having that episode after my heart surgery meant so much to me in, in that uh, it gave me hope. Who's the boss? Is. Angela Bauer. Whoa. Class dismissed. Who's <laughs> the boss? It has to be great to get back to work and, and dive yes. into that. <laughs> yes. There was teacher. Yeah. Teacher uh -huh. again, teacher. not principal, but teacher. I wanted to draw the line between Glee and Groundhog Day because the characters share the same last name. And I have no idea. <laughs> I've been asked that so many times, mm -hmm. and I never thought to ask Ian or Ryan if Ned Ryerson spawned Sandy Ryerson right. or whatever. Could it have been? <laughs> Could it have been? Ned Ryerson! Needle nose Ned, Ned the head, come on, buddy. Is that still the thing that people see you and they uh, they want to shout that at you, that they yes. know you from that? Yes, everywhere, all over the world. Mm -hmm. All over the world, and not only do they go, bing, or they go like, watch out for that first step, it's a doozy. Yeah. After they do that, they say, has anyone ever done that to you before? And I go like three times mm -hmm. today. Uh, it's wonderful because it's such a great movie. You know, if it were a terrible movie, it would be a curse. But the fact it's such a wonderful movie and such a wonderful part, and people have used Groundhog Day as a, 
a teaching element for so many ideas. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of that film and the work and Harold Ramis, yeah. God love him, and Bill and Andy and, and Chris. I mean, it was just a wonderful uh, experience to do it. So I'm happy to be yeah. reminded of it daily, <laughs> sometimes hourly. <laughs> and I mean, outside of that, this sort of movie set around a time loop, like you've seen that in other genres now too. It's 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 made a distinct mark what, on Edge of culture. Tomorrow or yeah, something? Come on. I'm going like, hey, yeah. wait a minute. I've seen this before. <laughs> You're waiting to see yourself uh, yeah, pop up. I want, I want to see. <laughs> I, well, and, and then uh, Happy Death Day. I was going to say. That's Happy another... Death Day. And then my character was a, a woman in black leotards. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going like, oh, that's me. <laughs> Odie, try something else. Maybe there's a game on. <laughs> the call that came to me was, we're bringing five actors in. Here are the lines. Uh -huh. If you get the part, you start this afternoon. So I was like... Yeah. So I auditioned and I got the word that I got the part and then they gave me a little extra time. They gave me an extra day or something. And then Bill started his Garfield cat like two months later or something after I finished. And he said like, oh, I'm sorry I missed. He sent me the loveliest little uh -huh. note saying, sorry I missed you on the show. But, you know, <laughs> it, but it's amazing. Garfield, Garfield uh, people, a lot of kids recognize me from Garfield. They love that show. You can work harder, much harder. How? With a little system I like to call the conjoined triangles of success. I get a call from my agent and manager at the same time. That's always important. They say, where are you now? Can you be in Los... I said, well, I'm in Arkansas, Hot Springs, Arkansas. They said, can you be in Los Angeles? They want you to audition again for producers for Silicon Valley. I'm going... And so we were doing a scene for Jack Barker and keep the camera there, right? Keep, keep the camera there because this is what I did. They said, just, Stephen, just be Jack. Just take over the room. And I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Listen, let me tell you, friend, <laughs> I did this and I walked completely out of frame and then I left and went down the hallway and I chased the girl who was reading with me out of the room. <laughs> I chased her out of the room, down the hallway, over to the stairway and then down the stairway and I'm hearing the guys laughing in the room that I didn't do any audition on camera at all. And by the, I walked from the room to my car and my phone started ringing while I'm walking to my car, you've got the part. You start tomorrow. So it was another one of those things, you start tomorrow. So I went right over into costuming, and I'm going like, what the hell are we doing? Mm -hmm. But what a group of people. Yeah. What amazing group of people on Silicon Valley. <sighs> Sammy, it's time for my shot. You mentioned that it was the most difficult and rewarding role yes. you ever took. Still feels that way? Still. Yeah. After all this time, mm -hmm. yes, because when you are playing a character that can't remember anything, as an actor, what we have to always do is remember exactly what we're doing so we match. And so the from different camera angles. Uh, so I had one of two choices. I had amnesia in my life where, uh, should I mention the amnesia story? <laughs> yeah. I, I had uh, a kidney stone problem at the hospital. I'm always at the hospital. Yeah. They gave me uh, an experimental anesthesia to where it doesn't put you to sleep but makes you forget. So, and they do it for bigger guys. There's the bigger, <laughs> again, with Jamie Foxx jumping on my back. Being a bigger guy, the, the medical community came up with a way to where we can get on our own operating table and they don't have to carry us and put us on an operating table. But we forget immediately what happened. So we feel the pain, but immediately forget it. So I had this surgery, but like any general anesthetic, it took several days for it to wear off of my system. So I would be born this moment holding a glass of water that was empty, like the glass was just about empty, and I didn't know if 
I had drunk the water and I was taking it back to the kitchen, or if I was thirsty and I, was, and I didn't know what I was doing. So I understood what amnesia was. And so with Chris, I said, you know, uh, Chris, no, I said, you're going to have a lot of people want to be in this movie because it's so spectacular, this greatest script I've ever read. I said, but you won't have a lot of people who've had amnesia. So I have amnesia, and I can bring that. <laughs> I can bring that. But boy, it's hard to act when you, when you cannot remember, seriously cannot remember what you just did. That was tough. Still the hardest.